seem to be several different things um, that I want to do today. And um, I want to try to get, uh, get them in some reasonable order. Um, one is I want to do the second Feynman diagram. Second thing is God, I've forgotten what? Yes, I want to do the uh, Feynman propagator in uh, the S&P metric. And um, then there's something that's been hanging fire for a couple of weeks, namely whether you guys want to see that second problem, 2.2D or something? The one involving the Nerfa symmetry. And you don't have to do it. If you don't want to do it, you don't want to see if you just want to read online, that's fine. Okay. And then finally, there's this, there's the issue of um, doing some of the other eight yards of the quantization of the electromagnetic field. Okay, so there's at least somebody who wants that. That would be your account. Give me that. I don't think we need to do that, but <laughs> that's my opinion. Should have said something. <laughs> I am. Well, let's put it. I mean, you know, there are eight yards there. We can do. Uh, we said on Friday it was really only feet. four yards. Huh? <laughs> we said on Friday it was really only four yards. <laughs> well, it was four and four. The second four. The second four is the direct bracket approach. And that's, that's, that stands apart, actually. And I mean, when you do with the direct bracket, let, let me just tell you the, the, the situation with these direct brackets. I mean, it's again one of these wonderful things that Dirac invented. But you go huffing and puffing through it, and it's like taking one of those nice walks in the woods where you actually have a loop trail and you come back to the scent and come back to where you started. Well, you're wiser, but you're back in the same place. I mean, you've had a nice time, but you're back in the same place. So, um, all right, anyway, let's, um, now where are my notes for the main topic, which is the This is kind of absurd. I can't. So we want to do the uh, second diagram, and and this diagram looks like this. space time. It could be before 
or after. That's why this line is horizontal. Time is going up. Time looks like that. Okay, so uh, S2 is minus a half g squared, square root of twice the energies. A uh, vacuum A P one prime P P two prime, and now we have an integral of a time ordered product of and a psi plus theta of x one psi minus of x one phi of x one psi minus theta x2 psi plus of x2 phi of x2 d fourth x1 d fourth x2 a dagger p1 b dagger p2 vacuum. Okay? Remember, this came from expanding. Uh, we basically have that S is the matrix element of the time ordered product of e to the minus i integral um, H interaction at x equal of x initial state, and we pull down. Uh, the first term is one, that's, that gives zero. The second term doesn't have enough fields to give non-zero contribution. The third term is minus i squared over two factorial and then an integral of time order product two of each of the and, um, Just h interaction here is g psi dagger psi phi. You want to turn in the um, the homework goes here and your no oh but you okay so this is what we've got. And um, now if we put in our expression for psi plus, psi minus, and so forth, leaving phi as it is, what we get is uh, minus a half g squared square root twice the energies of the initial and final states. Back to AP1 prime, DP2 prime. That's the Integral, time ordered product, Big parenthesis, integral, dq, q1, dq, q2, dq, q1 prime, dq, q2 prime, divided by 2 pi to the 12 and the square root of the two q zeros. And then these various factors, that these various things that come in here are a dagger q1, a dagger q1 prime, e to the i, q1 prime, x1, b dagger q2 prime, e to the i, q2 prime, x1, phi of x1, b q2, e to the minus i q2 x2 a q1 e to the minus i q1 x2 close parenthesis d4 x1 d4 x2 a dagger p1 b dagger p2 back so this is the expression and remember, we have um, A of Q1, A dagger E1, 
vacuum in the test in Schroeder notation, TQ, uh, 2 pi Q delta Q of uh, Q1 minus P1. So, so, there's an enormous amount of cancellation that happens almost immediately here. Um, this A kicks out a delta function and a 2 pi Q. Then the B kicks out another delta function and a 2 pi Q. And I somehow skipped all that, so maybe I should put in some of this at this point. The, so in other words, this thing is equal to minus a half g squared, square root of two e's vacuum. Okay, well let, let me say that this a dagger couples with this gives a two pi cube and a delta, and then the b couples with this two pi cube and a delta. So all the operators are arranged just automatically in such a way that the thing is as simple as possible and I don't even need to tell you you can ignore a particular term because since the final initial momentum are different, it wouldn't contribute. Um, somebody should invent better chalk though. I'm, I'm on my third piece. Um, okay, so what we've got then here is integral of this time ordered product and now uh, integral, so we have again d cubed, q1, d cubed, q2, d cubed, q1 prime, d cubed, q2 prime. So I'm filling in what's not in the notes. We have then 2 pi to the 12, the square root of 2 q zeros, all the q zeros. But then what we get is 2 pi, well, it's going to occur four times. So it's 2 pi to the 12. And then we have delta cubed of P1 prime minus Q1 prime. Delta cubed of P2 prime minus uh, Q2 prime. And then we have delta cubed of um, P1 minus Q1 and delta Q of P2 minus Q2. And what's left is, of course, phi of x1, phi of x2, still inside the time ordered product, which I can close at this point. And then the phase factors are e to the minus i q1 prime x1 plus i q2 prime x1 minus i q2 x2 minus i q1 x2. So I have a question about the fact that... And this is a plus, sorry. Question, we're getting uh, these three vector, or these three dimensional delta functions, right? Yes, three-dimensional double function. So how is it that our four vector up in these exponential Ready? Pieces? Yeah. So what happens to the time component? I mean, we're able to set, for instance... Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant question. The answer is the Q0 in all of these uh, DQQ, and the, the Q0 here, the DQQ, and the Q0s in here, they're always square root of m squared plus three vector Q squared where n is the mass of whatever field it is. So when you set uh, the three vector q is equal to four vector, this q zero is automatically, or the, take the value of q zero. Okay. So. And what I've got here is just vacuum. So that's the end of the story. And now, um, these Dirac delta functions are, of course, our friends. It's amazing how many things Dirac invented. The delta function, the Dirac brackets, 
the interaction picture. He even invented the passenger. Really, the Feynman direct camera. Unbelievable. And the relativistic treatment of the electron. And he was good at raising roses. All right. Anyway, so you do the Q's integration. You get the delta functions. That sets the Q zeros equal to the P zeros of the external state. So the E's cancel. And what you finally get here, then, is, let me write it up here. But S2 is, in fact, simply minus a half G squared integral vacuum time order product of phi of X1, phi of X2. E to the I, P1 prime, X1, plus I, P2 prime, X1, minus I, and I might as well combine them, P1 plus P2, P4 of X1, P4 of X2. I met Dirac, actually, once or twice with Wigner. And Wigner's sister was Dirac's wife. It's not a dream. Are there any other stories that accompany that? Well, I asked him. He and Wigner were sitting on a couch at a party. And what was sort of new in the air was that Mandelstam had proved that supersymmetric N equals 4, N equals 4 supersymmetric gauge theory of a certain kind was ultraviolet finite. And I knew that Dirac had always taken the infinities more seriously than other people who would just sort of brush them off and say, well, you can renormalize them away. Which did not go with mathematical detergent, and they're gone. And so I asked him or them what they thought of it. They just looked at me and didn't say a word. So I waited, waited. All right, anyway. So on the other hand, at that time, he was probably 90 years of age, so at least 85. What? Maybe he's here in the sky. Well, what's possible? OK. Now, as I will derive in a little while, the time-ordered product of the mean value of a scalar field with itself in the vacuum is, in testing further notation, is delta sub f of x1 minus x2. And this is the integral d4 of p over 2 pi to the fourth, i over p squared minus m squared plus i epsilon, e to the minus i of p x1 minus x2. OK. So all we have to do is to take this integral and stick it in here, and then do the remaining integrals. And the remaining integrals are very simple to do, because the d4x, the x's occur only as these phase factors. So the d4x integration just gives us direct delta functions. And then the p integration, which otherwise we couldn't do, becomes trivial. It just turns into a number. And so what we get is s2 minus a half g squared integral 
identifying the chalk and um, and after a while you get the hang of it. There's a big piece down here. Do you need it later? Yeah. Okay, so in other words, the the over there we had sort of a mixed diagram. This was kind of a space-time Feynman diagram. When you come over here, what you say is that this first term represents this. P1 comes in, P1 prime goes out. So this, if you conserve energy momentum, this thing is carrying P1 minus P1 prime. And so the propagator, this term here represents this propagator. And then the antiparticle does this, P2, P2 prime. And uh, so this one grabs P2 and subtracts. In other words, this this final momentum here is P2 prime is equal to P1 minus P1 prime plus P2. And you can see if you put P1 prime over on the other side, you have energy momentum conservation. So it's this thing plus this other diagram. And this is P1, P2. So this line here is carrying P1 plus P2. This P1 and P2 come in, and then P1 prime goes out, and P2 prime goes out as an end. You're adding them together because they're kind of, there's no way to tell which one happens. This is kind of the idea, so you need to both contribute. But it seems well, like. Well, the real reason you add them together is because when you do the calculation, they come out with a plus sign. That's the real reason. Um, the what you're saying is, um, you know, probably true. Uh, so let's see. What were you saying? You were saying that you don't know which happens. So you yeah, but it's. In, but I was. That's because I was thinking this is the. This is the. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's right. According to general quantum mechanics, if you have two amplitudes for going from the initial state, P1, P2, to the final state, P1 prime, P2 prime, then you add them together. Absolutely. But the subtlety is, how do you know what the relative sign is of the two amplitudes? See, there could have been a minus sign. When you have bosons, you tend not to have minus signs. If you have fermions, you can have minus signs. Because fermions anti at space time separations, so that brings in minus. In fact, this structure here, the time order product, for, for Bose fields, it's just but it's just what you think it is. It's the time order product. But for fermions, there's a built-in minus sign in the time order product. Alright. And let's see, you, you, you get a... There it is. Fine. Sorry. Damn, that was M&M. Do you, you want a second one? Ah, uh, no, that's fine. Right. That's another question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, um, let's see, where were we? Uh, are there any more questions? And then I'll go on to try the propagator. This is something I should have done earlier, but... Um, Somehow I got sidetracked. All right, now I want to make sure that these now uh, these are not the right ones. I'm going to get the right set of notes here because one set is updated. Yeah, this is a good set. No, this is a set that's directly from. Uh, all right, this. Please, God, let this be the one. Yes. Okay, now, the. The Feynman propagator. As, um, 
Line Bird writes it, but in the test and further metric is the following. It's an integral e to the minus i kx d4 k over 2 pi to the fourth divided by minus k squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And this is equal to i df of x, where df is this one over here. So you multiply this df by i, you get a minus i, and that puts a minus i here, a plus sign there, and a minus sign there, which is what you've got. Now, the time-ordered product of two fields, well, this is something that uses a function that was introduced by Heaviside. That was actually his name, and it's so appropriate to invent a function that had one Heaviside and one Lightside. In other words, zero and then one. He's an English mathematician. So this is the time-ordered product. Theta is the Heaviside function. Theta is, well, I've given an argument, so I don't have anything. Theta of, say, z is z plus absolute value of z divided by twice the absolute value of z. So for z negative, you get zero. For z positive, you get one. All right. Now, what we'll see is that minus i ds of x minus y, which is equal to d sub f of x minus y, equals zero time on the product, phi of x, phi of y. All right, where df is defined over there. So just to write it down one more time. E minus i kx, i over k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon equals k over k phi to the fourth. And you see this is the thing that I used over here in study. All right, now this Feynman propagator is a Green's function for the differential operator. Box plus m squared ds x equals delta 4 of x. And here, box is d0 squared minus or plus minus triangle sign. So this is kind of a mathematical joke there. This is d0 squared minus the divergence of the gradient. And if this is written as triangle, then when you add the fourth dimension, you make a box. Anyway. So I just had one clarification. So those two terms are coming from the expansion of that time-ordered exponential, right? Right. Everything comes from here. Yeah, so the S1, so both S1 and S2 will have g squared? g squared, yes, because they're two factors. This thing came in twice. I'll assume that counts as one question. So do we keep the same Feynman propagator in the same form that's basically, I don't know, comes from the Klein-Gordon equation for all of this? Is that because that's like... Well, 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 okay. 
I mean, I'm just saying that parenthetically, it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, Green's function for this um, uh, differential operator. We're going to derive it um, from. We're going to we're going to get an expression for this. We're going to rewrite this in terms of other things, and we're going to relate those other things to uh, this back, mean value in the vacuum of the time order product. The time order product is written that way, and the fields are written in the conventional way. And we'll see everything works out. Do we have different Green's functions, or we always have something like this? I mean, it is the case in that diagram where the propagator is used is for that intermediate particle, but that means that thing does have a free. Right, it is a free particle. And I, I, I mean, you're asking about like interactions or something, right? Like, yeah. I've sort of lost the thread right. here. Um, I'm just wondering, so if we, if this is the the Green's function uh, solution for kind of the the Klein-Gordon equation. It is. It is one of the many Green's functions. Okay. You but you put it. the i epsilons in as you want, and. Okay, do you guys want me to show you why this is a green function for this? All right, let me just say it briefly. What happens is that the d by z zero squared here brings down a minus k zero squared. Actually, I see there's a minus sign off here. Oh, no, it's df, sorry, it's df. So it's, D, it's delta f that's the green function. So, which is the one Weinberg uses. So you differentiate twice with respect to x0 squared, you get a minus k0 squared. Minus k0 squared. Down here, with the pest control metric, so this is a minus k0 squared, and they cancel. Then when you differentiate with minus the Laplacian, you get down a plus k squared, k3 vector squared, which is then a, cancels the plus k squared here in the pest control metric. The m squares cancel, the i epsilon becomes irrelevant, and then, so, so in other words, box plus m squared on delta f just gives you uh, this expression. How is it? This expression of the four-dimensional right. Okay, so now I'm going to stay with this uh, form, which is to say this form, and what uh, finally did was he stuck in, I'm going to write it this way, delta four q or the two pi to the four, um, e to the minus i to x over minus q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. He stuck in this minus i epsilon in order to get, in order for it to give you the mean value of the vacuum of the time order product, like from an i or something. All right, the key thing here, which I think can confuse students, is this following step. Okay, so this. This is one that I don't think I've ever seen in the literature anybody or in a class, everybody, anybody ever go to the trouble to explain actually how this works. So this is q dot q minus q zero squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as e sub q minus i epsilon prime minus q zero times e sub q minus i epsilon prime plus q zero plus epsilon prime squared. Now what's epsilon prime? Epsilon prime is epsilon divided by two e q. And of course e q is the energy of a particle in the cube, so it's n squared, right to square. Of course, h bar and c are one, so I'm going to say that. Oh, 
Okay. So, in other words, this denominator in the piston for a metric is this, and then I factor it this way, and the reason for factoring it is, um, what do I want to say? Um, well, we want to factor it because these poles, but then we're going to neglect epsilon prime, epsilon prime squared because it's of second order in smallness. So this is going to go, I'm going to forget that one. A little Alzheimer's there. Um, Okay, so we drop the, we, we, we now want to do the Q0 integral, and I'm going to call that Q0. Oh, this trough is absolutely useless. I of Q then is going to be minus the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, dQ0 over 2 pi, e to the minus i Q0 x0. And now, um, where the minus sign comes? The minus sign comes because I'm going to write these as Q0 minus something. And in fact, what it's going to look like is this Q, well, I can just write it like this. Q0 minus EQ minus I epsilon. And I've dropped the prime. This is really epsilon prime. Q0 minus minus EQ plus I epsilon. So that's the way it looks. And the point is that this one hasn't changed, but this one has flipped sign. Okay? And that gives you the minus sign. Okay, so this function f of q zero, which is e to the minus i q zero x zero times divided with these two denominators, q0 minus q minus i epsilon, q0 minus minus q plus i epsilon. This is a function that has poles at two places. Where are they? Well, there's one that's over here at minus EQ plus I epsilon, and the other one is over here at EQ minus I epsilon. Okay. These are the two poles, and we start out with this integration along this real axis, like that, going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, so what we do is we add what I like to call ghost contours. These are contours that weren't there, but are zero. And so when we, add, we can add them because they're just zero. And so which ghost contour we add depends upon the sign of x zero. So if x zero is positive, then when Q0 has a negative imaginary part, this will be damped, because this will be positive, and you'll have a minus i times a minus i, that's a minus. So, for x0 greater than 0, we add a ghost contour this way. And that means we have a clockwise rather than a counterclockwise integration. The counterclockwise one that gives you the plus sign. Uh, and we pick up this pole here. And so what we're using is the famous integral, the famous theorem by Cauchy, that integral of f of z dz over z minus z0 1 over 2 pi i is equal to f of z0. If f is analytic and um, the contour goes counterclockwise around z0 once. And here we're going clockwise, so we have a minus sign. Um, 
It's going to kick out a 2 pi, but the 2 pi cancels. And what we get then is that I of Q for X0 greater than 0 is then I from the minus signs cancel because the integral is clockwise rather than counterclockwise. The 2 pi cancels, but what was left is an I, that I. We then get F at, evaluated at, effectively EQ, minus EQ. We get F at EQ, essentially. And F of EQ is I, E to the minus I, EQ X0, and then divided by 2 EQ. Q0 is EQ, so that's 2 EQ, and this is the thing that's Z minus Z0. Okay. For the case X0 less than 0, well, then you add a ghost contour this way. And now it is counterclockwise. It picks up this pole, and we get that I of Q is now equal to 2 pi I. The I's, the 2 pi cancels. The I doesn't cancel the minus sign, so we get a minus I, F at minus EQ. But F at, now this is Z minus Z0. F at minus EQ is minus, has a minus 2 EQ in the denominator. And so this one gives us I, E to the I, EQ X0 divided by 2 EQ. And so in terms of heavy size step function, we get minus I, I'm multiplying by minus I on the left. We get minus I, Q is 1 over 2 EQ times theta of X0, E to the minus I, EQ X0 plus theta of minus X0, E to the I, Q0, and EQ X0. So that's our expression. Now, of course, we still have left over DQ Q over 2 pi Q, and we have E to the I, Q dot X. And so now we bring in the Lorentz invariant function delta plus of X, which is defined as 1 over 2 pi Q integral DQ Q over 2 EQ. Notice that this is the Lorentz invariant measure DQ Q over an energy E to the I, Q dot X minus EQ X0. So this is delta plus. And that means then that minus I delta F of X is, and you see this just brings in all the things that we're missing. But maybe I should do it more slowly. Let's do it in two steps. I left out a step here. So minus I delta F would then be minus I integral DQ Q over 2 pi Q E to the I, Q dot X times what's left, which is just, yeah, which is just I of Q. And that gives us then, well, minus I times I of Q brings in this. So what we have here is DQ Q over 
too high Q, um, 2 EQ, um, times theta of x0 E di Q dot x minus EQ x0 plus theta of minus x0 um, E di Q dot x plus I an I here EQ x0 okay, so there I filled in the step list Probably should put in the notes. Well, I, you tell me, you just need to put in the notes. Or, Muscle 
a lens, wires, and uh, the, I don't know whether to pronounce it aqueous or aqueous humor, with an end of 1.336, and nerves. By the way, nerves here are a million nerve fibers that are actually going back. A million. I guess probably their axons going back. In fact, the, uh, the retina is properly part of the brain. This is just this, this is a, a, these things are neurons, many neurons in each eye. And um, Did I mention in class that the human brain has 60 trillion synapses? I have to mention that. Well, each of these axons, you've got a million axons going back in each eye. Each axon might uh, connect to a thousand or several thousand might might have several thousand synapses which are connections to other neurons, dendrites, what what happens is you've got the thing from the axon that comes down like that, and then there are these synapses, and then you've got this dendrite, and you've actually got spines on the dendrite, and the synapse goes from the axon to the spine on the dendrite there. And uh, when these dendrites come into um, uh, the resilience of them, they look like trees, and the dendrite is Greek tree. Anyway, that's the cell body, and then zoom, an axon goes out, and that axon can be a meter long. Or it can be micron, uh, no. And um, these are the synapses. So we have 60 trillion. That's why computers are not so good. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So those oh, yeah, there's going to be a hell of a long time before you get 60 trillion. <laughs> Equivalent of 60 trillion cents. So those small lines that you've drawn, they're the same on both of them? Or what? Um, all right, you're, 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 I, I haven't, I don't, I don't know the biology well enough to remember. I think that these spines are on the dendrites. And, um, but maybe they're also on the, on the axon. And the synapse is just basically two active regions that are very close to each other. And what happens is a um, a uh, the donor side from the axon. So this is from some axon. Um, the axon comes down, and then it branches into the zillion. Zillion fibers that touch a zillion cells. It might touch 10,000 cells, each one with 10,000, with hundreds of, of cement. And um, what happens is this axon, the surface of the axon, opens up and lets out some neurotransmitter, which then just drifts across, and there's not very much distance here. We're talking uh, less than about a micron. And it's then picked up by a receptor on the spine, in the synapse on the spine, the, the dendrite side of the synapse, let's say, a receptor picks it up and um, and then does something with it. And, uh, and as a consequence of all of these signals, all of these uh, signals through all the dendrites, maybe 10,000 signals, the, the axon decides to fire on them. Anyway. The whole thing basically is an incredibly complicated system. But it's a physical system and it's always seeking a state of lowest free energy. But it's noisy because not only is it at 300 Kelvin, but also 
um, uh, it's fed, uh, it has energy in the form of sugar and, and of course, oxygen and all sorts of constraints. Constraints meaning that what it does is it sends these neurotransmitters and these electrical signals. Once it decides to fire, what happens is a signal, electrical signal goes down the nerve, down the next. Um, anyway, so it, the, the noise comes in because it either fires or it doesn't. But the firing or not depends upon integrating all these signals. And so you can see that, you know, whether it fires or not, I mean, if it fired proportionately, you know, just added up all the signals and shot the thing out, then there'd be far less noise. But you've got, it's a noise generator almost, because it either fires or doesn't fire. And so a tiny bit less signal, and you get nothing. A tiny bit more, bingo, it fires. So it's a, it's, you can almost think of it as a chaotic system. Anyway, this was a tangent that wasn't meant to be. In other words, force is only possible to use noise. And of course, you need noise in order to get to a minimum free energy, which you have to jump over barriers. All right, so what we've got then is this formula here. And now what we want to do is look at the positive frequency part of a field and then test and throw the notation dqt 2 pi q root 2p0 e to the i p dot x minus i p0 x0 a and b for scalar fields of so OS. And find minus of x, in fact, is this is a scalar, neutral scalar field, which is the case over here. So there's just a and b. It's not a complex, it's not a1 plus i2, it's just a. And so this is just phi plus adjoint of x, which is of course dqp, q pi cubed, root two zero minus i p dot x plus i p zero x zero r. Okay, now again in the Peskin Schroeder notation, a of p, a dagger of q, the commutator is 2 pi q delta q plus q minus q. So um, let's compute the commutator of phi plus at x with phi minus at y. Uh, 
2P0 e to the minus i to the x minus y. And that is delta plus of x minus y. Okay? So that's delta plus. So I'm going to use a shot. I need to bring my water. I need to drink coffee. All right, I will skip the incidentally. And you can read it in the notes. So what do we have? We know what the time order product is. So let's look and see what minus i delta f of x minus y is. I think this is written backwards, actually. So let me not do that. Let me instead say, let us take the time order product of 5x, 5y, and just compute and see what it is. And we'll see that it's minus i times df delta f, or simply df of x minus y. And so this is the value of the vacuums, theta x0 minus y0, phi of x, phi of y, plus theta y0 minus x0, phi of y, phi of x. OK, but over here, this phi, if we put in phi plus, we'll get 0. So we might as well put in phi minus. This one, if we had phi minus, that would be a creation operator. That would annihilate the vacuum on the other side. So we might as well have phi plus here. Similarly here, this had better be phi minus, and this one had better be phi plus. OK. So what does this tell us? Well, this tells us one extra thing. Model is what you can do with chalk. You can't do it. You have to write several equations. If we change the order of phi plus to phi minus, we get 0. Because a phi plus on the right is annihilation operators, knock out the vacuum. A phi minus on the left is creation operators. So in other words, a of t vacuum equals 0. The adjoint of that equation is a dagger of t equals 0. And so this tells you that phi plus of x on the vacuum equals 0. And this tells you that 0 phi minus is 0. OK? So that means we can replace these things harmlessly by commutators. But once we've done that, we already know what the commutator is. This is then delta plus of x minus y times theta x0 minus y0. That's that term. And then this term is theta y0 minus x0. And this would be delta plus of y minus x. OK. But this is what we got over here. So this is equal to minus i delta f of x minus y. OK. So any questions? I haven't given out very much trouble. So any questions? You didn't even miss a call, but sometimes people ask questions and I forget to give out the call. Huh? So I had a question over to the problem thing. So when you are minimizing the free energy, what were you minimizing it for? Say that again. You said you would, I mean, you would minimize the free energy for the vacuum system, right? I'm 
Right. Right. The brain is a physical system, and like any physical system at a finite temperature, it bounces around looking for the looking for minimum free energy. In general, you write you write a free energy equation, you minimize it, and get an equation of state, right? Well, yeah. So what 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 does it mean? Well, here's the way I think of it. I think of it um, rather uh, like suppose you're Monte Carloing, say protein folding or some other complicated system, uh, a gauge field on a lattice or a lattice quantum system or a, the, the shape of a molecule. What you do is you randomly change the molecule. The shape, you randomly change the state and evaluate the energy. And if it's lower, you take it. If it's higher, then you take it conditionally. This is the standard metropolis step. And so you bounce around, the system bounces around, and automatically it is getting the state of minimum free energy. So, well, what I think is that if, 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 if the brain is getting new stimulation, new idea new, 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 through the eyes and ears and senses, and as it has these, um, as it bounces around, uh, every now and then it gets over some you know, high pass and falls into a state of minimum free energy and in my view that's called having an idea. Or more 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 generally it's pattern recognition. Pattern recognition of another than the and I think it's psychologically true, you know, all of a sudden, oh you see something, and that's because the brain has gotten over the over some Kyber Pass and gone down into Afghanistan. Was hijacked by the Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Anyway, all right. I think that's the end of the lecture. <laughs>